Hi, my name is Candace Benner, and I'm a family nurse practitioner who has sub-specialized in ears, nose, and throat for the last 14 years. You are getting ready to view the fourth module out of five that I have created to help nurse practitioners and physician's assistants evaluate and treat common ears, nose, and throat complaints. Upon completion of this module, the clinician will be able to diagnose the patient correctly based on the most common etiology for otorrhea with and without an intact tympanic membrane, develop appropriate plan of care based on the diagnosis, and evaluate the plan of care based on the patient's response and adapt if necessary. In the medical history, it may seem silly that I've included these particular bullet points, but oftentimes I find that if I ask the appropriate questions regarding the timing of the patient's symptoms, any significant situation associated with these symptoms, and any pertinent previous medical history associated with the current symptoms, I will oftentimes have an idea of what the correct diagnosis is prior to even touching the patient for the physical exam. The important takeaway point for this particular slide is as the clinician, it is important to try to determine if the tympanic membrane is intact or perforated. If you are unable to tell with 100% certainty, then assume that the tympanic membrane is perforated, meaning do not utilize treatment options in the ear that are not safe for the middle ear space or possibly ototoxic. This particular slide is pretty self-explanatory. Foreign body has been touched on in a previous module as well as bacterial external otitis. Remember that debridement of the external canal is important in order to treat the bacterial otitis externa effectively. If the clinician believes that there is possibility that uh, there is a fungal component to the external otitis, do not use antibiotic eardrops with steroids. It will just make the fungal component much worse. I would like to point out under bloody odorrhea that if at all possible to breathe the external canal, but if you feel that cleaning it will cause more harm, then it will need to be cleaned out under a binocular microscopy. You may want to consider using steroid drops that have an antibiotic in them if you believe there is an oral polyp that is the cause of the bloody odorrhea. Acute otitis media sometimes will be accompanied with a ruptured temp tympanic membrane. The patient then may experience purulent odorrhea that can cause a secondary infection to the external to canal. This of course would be treated with oral antibiotics as well as antibiotic eardrops containing a steroid and insertion of a wick. Chronic otitis media can occur in an ear with or without a cholesteatoma. Chronic otitis media is oftentimes observed with long-standing eustachian tube dysfunction. The formation of a cholesteatoma is thought to be secondary to the chronic eustachian tube dysfunction and the chronic otitis media. Although an in-depth discussion regarding cholesteatoma is outside the scope of this module, it is important for the nurse practitioner or physician's assistant to have a general understanding of how a cholesteatoma is formed, as well as where they are generally located upon physical exam. Cholesteatoma can appear to be a grayish-white keratinous mass in the anterior, superior, or inferior posterior aspect of the tympanic membrane. The keratinous mass can be dry or wet, as well as a congenital cholesteatoma in, generally, in general excuse me, is identified behind the anterior superior aspect of the tympanic membrane. A conductive and sensor hearing loss can be associated with a cholesteatoma. A CT of the temporal bone will help delineate the extent of the cholesteatoma. Treatment typically involves excision of the cholesteatoma and if left untreated the cholesteatoma can become destructive to the ossicles, labyrinth and erode into the facial nerve as well as extend beyond the middle ear space. 
With this particular slide, I'd like to point out that tympanic membrane perforations that occur secondary to trauma will usually heal within six to eight weeks. It may take a little bit longer if a large portion of the tympanic membrane was involved in the perforation. At the recheck appointment, if the perforation has healed, I will reevaluate the hearing to confirm that the hearing loss has resolved. Traumatic perforations that occur in the presence of a dirty object or in a body of non-chlorinated water may need to be treated with oral antibiotics as well as possibly antibiotic eardrops. Traumatic perforations associated with vertigo, facial weakness, or diminished hearing may represent disruption of the acicular chain, dislocation of the stapes foot plate, or possible temporal bone fracture. The nurse practitioner physician's assistant should not hesitate to involve the ears, nose, and throat surgeon should those particular symptoms be associated with hearing loss. This particular slide brings us to the end of the module of otorrhea. I hope the information that was given, you, given to you will help you meet each objective that was listed at the beginning of the module. I also hope that the information that you learned through this module will help you evaluate and treat your patient effectively for those who you see with the complaint of odorrhea.